Hello and welcome to the special edition of the Newsmakers from the TRT World Forum here in Istanbul, where some of the world's biggest players and power brokers are trying to solve and tackle some of the region and the world's biggest security issues. We begin with this warning from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Hezbollah is deliberately using the innocent people of Beirut as human shields. They've placed three of these missile conversion sites along Beirut's international airport. Well, I put that warning to former Prime Minister of Lebanon, Fuad Senora. Fuad Senora, pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Welcome to Istanbul. Thank you. Let me begin by asking you about some of the latest news coming out of Lebanon or about Lebanon from the mouth of Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister. He says that when your foreign minister gave other dignitaries a tour of the country, it was basically a Hezbollah show. They hid away the weapons and that they are key weapons in places like the airport even that Hezbollah hid while the government gave a tour to show that the country is clean and that there are no Hezbollah weapons. Is that true? Well, let me start by saying that uh, Hassan Nasrallah, he himself said that we have arranged to have rockets of high precision, in his own words, and uh, he did not hide that. Now, whether actually, as Netanyahu claimed, that these weapons and these rockets are in a place near the airport and within civilian uh, quarters, I don't know. Mm. Actually, uh, on the one hand, the plaintiff has to really come up with the proofs. Mm. Netanyahu has to come up with the proofs. On the other hand, the Minister of Foreign Affairs had a tour with a number of, of, of uh, ambassadors and the like, they went into areas and said uh, that there is nothing. Actually, in this sense, what I really uh, see it, that uh, regarding these particular positions for having or not having uh, 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 rockets, I think Israel has to come with the proofs into that. But what, and what actually Netanyahu is meaning out of this, actually, these threats, is to uh, really uh, blackmail Lebanon on the one hand and try to divert attention from what Israel is doing. Actually, is Israel is the aggressor, and not Hassan Nasrallah in this in this particular thing. You see, is Israel is the aggressor. Israel is doing all sorts of things in order to uh, really. Uh, uh, First of all, not only Lebanon, I mean, attacking Lebanon, and because over the past 30 years, there are more than six invasions that Israel committed against Lebanon. Besides that, Israel, what is, what is doing actually in, 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 in Palestine and in Jerusalem in particular, further, I mean, following to what actually uh, President, uh, uh, Obama, uh, President Trump has done in terms of uh, transferring the the uh, the American embassy from Tel Aviv into into Jerusalem to indicate that there is no more cause for for the Palestinians and there is nothing actually called Jerusalem and actually as being the capital of of the of the state of Palestine, together with what the Israelis have been doing regarding the Jewishness of the state, and uh, I mean all these measures are in fact wanted. By, by Netanyahu and by, by Israel in order to divert attention from what is going on. The problem is there. Actually, in order to uh, really cover up this thing, they are creating some of these issues. I'm not claiming that there are no rockets and no high precision. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is something mentioned by, by uh, Hassan Nasrallah himself, you see. And this is causing some, some problems, actually, for, for Lebanon, which can, we can really talk about it. Right. So talking about resolving things and justice, the Rafiq Hariri trial yes. has wrapped up. We probably only expect a verdict next year. But we look at this and we see that 
the four accused weren't even in the dock, we see a lot of criticism of the entire tribunal. Do you think that the result will bring about a semblance of justice and closure for the Lebanese people? Yes. You put your finger on a very important topic, which is justice. And the, 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 the Middle East, actually, and the Arab world has been suffering from the lack of justice on, on several fronts. The Arab-Israeli conflict, on the one hand, the problem that has been really simmering for quite a lot in terms of, of, of oppressive regimes against the people of, of, of the region, against the Arab in, in so many countries, whether it, is, it was in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya. I mean, with these oppressive regimes that really led to, 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 further, to further instability in the region. Now we come actually to the trial uh, against those who really committed the crime of, uh, 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 of killing Rafiq Hariri. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in, in here, one has to really take in consideration a very important thing that Lebanon, because of its diversity, its freedom, freedom of speech, and in enjoying relatively much higher level of freedom than any other Arab country. In fact, uh, uh, the killing of Rafiq Hariri is not the first incident that we suffered from. Lebanon suffered from the, uh, uh, the, the killing of three prime ministers mm -hmm. and an attempt against the fourth one, and killing two presidents and a number of ministers, a number of, of journalists and the clergies and so on. And all these crimes have been really left there with no, uh, with no uh, uh, let's say, a special court uh, that can really uh, handle. And uh, in fact, uh, until the, 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 the case of Rafiq uh, Hariri. Uh, and I believe what is that uh, uh, this, I mean, we, we have seen the latest rounds of the, of the tribunal. And there are certain really pointing fingers mm -hmm. against Hezbollah. But if it comes out and they say Hezbollah did it, I think at the direction of Syria or Iran or Syria fine, and Iran, fine. Nasrallah is going to say, "Go to hell! Don't play with fire! We're not cooperating." How is that going to bring justice and, or closure next year? Let me tell you something. First of all, it is very important that the court has to come up with its verdict, mm -hmm. because justice has to really be known. And, and, the, and the, what really happened has to be known. And uh, justice has to be finally uh, be, uh, be really expressing itself in the form of the verdict of the court, which actually is coming up with lots of, of let's say, proofs. It's not uh, these evidences are, let's say, in thousands. Right. It's not something. But I'm giving you a political reality. I know, I know. I after think, it comes out, I think after it comes out, how do you let deal me with it? let me put it this way: mm. the first thing, let it come out, okay, and then we will look into things how it should really be handled. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it is it is really helpful to start talking about whether or not whether to really come up with a verdict or not. We should have a verdict, and then we will see how to really handle the matter to the best interest of the country and the best interest of the people of Lebanon. For those who look at your country not as a sovereign state, but as, at the moment, a refugee-absorbing country that is just a proxy battleground between Iran on the one hand and Saudi Arabia on the other, your response is? Well, Leb Lebanon definitely suffers from, uh, let's say, problems within and problems of the region and the world. Uh, and, and actually, uh, to, to some extent, Lebanon suffered a great deal uh, and being penalized for uh, its, uh, its uh, good sides, uh, much more than for its bad, bad, bad uh, let's say, aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for, for, the, for the good aspects of it, uh, being open, being uh, tolerant, being uh, uh, diverse, and so on, and with high degree of freedom, freedom of speech, uh, 
we, we suffered, we suffered a great deal because of regional pressures and so on. Now, actually, we have a situation in which uh, Lebanon is suffering from the presence of of uh, uh, Hezbollah on the one hand that is really uh, having weapons and that is competing with the with the state uh, for its its uh, really dominance over the over all parts of the country and as you know it's, the, this con this situation cannot continue uh, and we know that uh, there are some reasons that has to do with the with the continuation of the Arab Arab Israeli conflict, but we have something else that at the same time, which is the interference of Iran uh, in the affairs of of Lebanon, not only Lebanon actually. I mean, uh, Iran has been confessing and stating it very right. clearly that they are interfering in the in the affairs of Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and 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 Yemen. So, can I give you the other side of the coin? Yes. Do you have a prime minister who is not totally independent? who's controlled by Mohammed bin Salman? Well, uh, you see, uh, this, 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 uh, this aspect of the situation, I think that that, that is something that uh, the page has been turned. Uh, uh, again, I mean, and it's no longer actually something to, to, be, to be taken in consideration. It was a mistake, and I think this is something that has to be turned aside. But what is there, actually, there is a, a, a relationship that has prevailed over, the, over so many decades of good relations between Saudi Arabia and Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia is an Arab country, and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia has proven uh, over the past decades how, how it has been helpful and supportive to Lebanon and its independence. And as you know, we are really enjoying now the peace that was really uh, done uh, in, in Taif in 1989, and when which the Taif agreement was approved and uh, really later on was legalized uh, and put part of the constitution. Certainly, they brought, they helped they bring brought peace help help. and end the civil war. But yes. I mean, if I can ask it as bluntly as possible, yeah. Iran controls Hezbollah, which controls large parts of society. I wouldn't say the state. In a way, it's competing with the state. It's a part of the state. It's, it's in politics. It On is, the other side of the coin, yeah. your successor, Saad Hariri, the son of Rafiq Hariri, is he controlled by Saudi Arabia? No. I don't think I any mean, the word that is controlled by Saudi Arabia. I mean, there are lots of commonalities <coughs> between Lebanon and Saudi Arabia. And there are lots of, let's say, support mm -hmm. uh, to the good yeah. relations between Lebanon and Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, the relationship with Iran, we want to have a healthy relationship with Iran, in which there is no intervention in the domestic affairs of, of Lebanon. And as you know, if you want to compare, let's say, and it's, it's, not, it's not good to compare, in fact, because this is an Arab country and this is a non-Arab country. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of common interests between Lebanon and, and, uh, and Iran. As you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people who, Lebanese, who work in Saudi Arabia and, and areas of and, and many many countries in the region? This tells the the the, the basic common interest mm -hmm. between Lebanon and the Gulf, and particularly with Saudi Arabia. What I believe is that uh, the relationship with Iran, we have Iran is 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 a neighbor, and we have to recognize this neighbor, and we have to extend the hand to Iran to build a good friendship but on the basis of non-intervention and on the basis of what, not the theory that has been brought by, by Khomeini at one time, which is the, the, the Wilayat al-Faqih across national frontiers, which really gives the, the, the supreme leader in Iran the right to intervene in the affairs of certain groups of people within right. countries against the, against the sovereignty of the state. So what I really want to say is that Saudi Arabia is an Arab country. Saudi Arabia has proven over the years that it has been supportive to Lebanon and, and, to, and to its affairs. And the one that rescued Lebanon uh, in 1989, on the one hand, and at the same time, in so many invasions, actually, that, that took place. You see, Lebanon has been subjected to several invasions in 78 from Israel and in 82 and in 93, and in 96, and in 206. And, and, 206. 
And had it not been for the support of Saudi Arabia, we would have been in a really miserable situation. Lebanon has to really have good relations with its neighbors and in, in, with, with its friends. Iran can be a good friend to Lebanon, but it has to confess that this cannot continue, this situation of interfering in the affairs of Lebanon and in the affairs of many other Arab countries. It, it, is, it is a shame, actually, when some Iranian leaders say that we have a say, a controlling say, in the affairs of what's going on in Iraq and Syria, Lebanon and Yemen. And this cannot really be accepted and cannot continue. So this is not wise, actually, to put Iran and Saudi Arabia on the same footing, but at the same time, it has to be really said that some real effort, that Iran cannot continue bleeding as it is now, actually, with its domestic problems on the one hand, with, it, with its relationship with the countries of the region, with its relationship with so many countries around the world, and with the sanctions that are being imposed on Iran because of its policies and its intervention in the region, so on. This cannot continue. It's not in the interest of Iran. Definitely, the Iranians themselves, they have to really uh, know what, what is their interest and what's not in their interest. I am saying from a, per from a person and a country that is suffering from the intervention of Iran in the affairs of Lebanon and the affairs of the, of the region. And that's why I think with the best thing is that there should be a, 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 first of all, a, an awareness that this continuous bleeding and this, 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 the, these problems cannot continue as such that is being really imposed on Iran. On the other hand, they have to realize that there are common interests between Iran and the Arab world. And that's why I think that some real effort has to be made alongside with the, the position taken by Iran to stop its intervention to really extend the hand to Iran. For what, Senora? Pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. So a big fear and big warning from Fuad Senora that Iran, in his opinion, is meddling in countries like Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. I put that to our panel and asked them if it's true. David Patrikarakos is the author of Nuclear Iran, The Birth of an Atomic State, and Ali Asghar Sultaniyeh is the former Iranian ambassador to the IAEA and the United Nations. They disagreed on the issue. But first, here's this report from Shoaib Hassan. It's become one of the biggest standoffs in the Middle East, an increasingly hostile U.S. administration bent on cutting a defiant Iran down to size. America wants to put pressure for the sale of oil, America wants to put pressure for trade and banking, and all of these things are done and are done and are done, and no one has no longer left that he wants to do in the November of the month. So, this is the word of the month of November, which is completely complicated. Next month, the sanctions approved by U.S. President Donald Trump will take full effect. He announced them after tearing up the nuclear peace deal with Iran. It had been brokered between Tehran and the international community, principally the U.S. and the European Union. The EU says it will stay faithful to the deal, but European companies have already started rolling back operations in the Islamic Republic. Iran has taken the matter to the International Court of Justice at the UN which has since issued a ruling limiting the sanctions. But US officials say the International Court has no jurisdiction in the matter and they will not accept its rulings. The US also insists it's not just nuclear proliferation that Iran is guilty of. The Syrian regime's butchery is enabled by Russia and Iran. The Iranian regime exports violence, terror and turmoil. It illicitly procures sensitive items to advance its ballistic missile program and proliferates these missiles all across the Middle East. The regime is the world's leading sponsor of terror and fuels conflict across the region and far beyond. A regime with this track record must never be allowed to possess a nuclear weapon. 
Iran has denied the charges while keeping a brave face. But the sanctions could prove too costly for its already struggling economy. There have been nationwide protests against rising inflation and unemployment. As the US tightens the screws, the real question is, how will Iran respond? Shweb Hassan, the newsmakers. Well, I'm joined now by David Patrikarakos, the author of Nuclear Iran, The Birth of an Atomic State, also War in 140 Characters, uh, and Ali Asghar Sultania, who's been the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations, the IAEA, and other organizations. Good to have both of you on the panel here to discuss Iran, of course. Mr. Ambassador Ali Asghar Sultania, I just spoke with Fuad Senora, the former Lebanese prime minister. He said to me that it's quite unacceptable what Iran is trying to do in Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Yemen. They see Iranian influence as altogether negative, him and others. What do you think about that? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first of all, I want to say that whatever I'm saying is uh, in my personal capacity yes. as a retired diplomat. Second, I've been invited to talk about international cooperation against uh, terrorism in this uh, conference, which I really congratulate, a very well organized conference in right time and right place. Uh, having said so, I just can say that the Islamic Republic of Iran, based on its constitution and principles enshrined in the constitution following the revolution, is always for peace, uh, and security in all over the world and has great potential that has not been uh, in fact uh, used or understood by some powers even in the region that could uh, play a role for uh, conflict resolutions and uh, solving the problems. Uh, of course uh, our national security is utmost importance for us for any country and uh, if this national security is threatened, uh, we have to take action. As you notice, uh, the last uh, tragic uh, terrorist uh, act, heinous uh, uh, threat of attack, attack uh, in uh, uh, my country, uh, was prompted by immediate, appropriate, concise, and precise targeting reaction. Uh, which gives the clear message that we cannot tolerate uh, any sort of threat against our country. Uh, having uh, unfortunately tragic uh, experience of eight years of imposed war by Saddam, that superpowers and particularly the United States was fully supporting, and we were able to resist and uh, finally concur, gives also another, uh, uh, in fact, Certainly. message that we will defend. We will defend any threat. But would you accept that there are those who would say that you could have this heinous attack in Ahvaz, which could predominantly be very much a local issue, and respond accordingly to a terror attack, but still not meddle in other countries that have nothing to do with it? Absolutely, with due respect, I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. It was not internal problem, uh, you know very well. Uh, we do not have any problem of uh, this kind of sort of uh, separatist sort of uh, actions or so. For a thousand years, uh, we have been all united, different tribes, different groups or so. Uh, therefore, these have been provocation from outside, uh, in the region or outside, uh, funded uh, terrorists, uh, petrodollars, and uh, they have claimed, in fact, as my president said uh, in the United Nations General Assembly, they have publicly interviewed uh, in Western countries those who have, got, uh, in fact, accepted responsibilities of these actions, and they are active the same place that uh, Iranian ballistic missiles targeted them. Right, and there is a claim that it's the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Americans involved, and so there have been a lot of countries named, but I want to move beyond that now and again go to the big picture. David, on the whole, the Iranians see their policy in terms of foreign policy recently as defensive and an expression of independence protecting their national security. Is that the case? I mean, again, uh, I will caveat as well by saying I was in, it sort of came on to be about nuclear issues. Um, look, I mean, the region at the moment is extremely tense. Uh, there are certain pressures, there are certain pulls 
Uh, I mean, the Iranians obviously see their actions as defensive. It is, you know, one has to say that Iran has not started a war for a very, very, very long time. Uh, I think, you know, the degree to which is involved in other countries is, is unfortunate. I think that, um, you know, there is a certain element there that is, is not helping things. I also think, however, that, uh, you know, with recent events like uh, Donald Trump's, to my mind, cretinous tearing up of the Iran deal, have made things more unstable mm -hmm. in the region. Uh, so I think that we have to look at the various forces that are affecting the region, that are impacting on Iran. And I have to say that, you know, of recent events, I would say that the abrogation on the United States part of the Iran deal is uh, extremely unfortunate and was an extremely stupid thing to yeah. do. So Ambassador Sultania, you, I mean, th this idea that the United States pulls out and provokes the Iranians, I think David would, would agree with you here. And that seems to be the thing that politically keeps everything together or had kept everything together. That was the hope of President Obama. That was the hope of President Rouhani. Trump doesn't share that hope. So now that Trump's out of the nuclear deal, what does that mean to the Iranians? Does that mean that you can never again trust the Americans and you're going it on your own? Uh, as uh, an expert working over uh, almost two uh, to three decades directly with the United Nations, I have a very clear message. United States uh, has either Democrats misused or instrumentally used uh, multilateralism in United Nations, and now uh, Republicans are against unilateralism. And what Mr. Trump has done shows disregard to any international agreement, uh, particularly under the umbrella of unilateralism or UN. Uh, therefore, this is a serious threat, in fact, to the world order that we discuss in this uh, August gathering. Uh, this uh, has a consequence, of course. Uh, disregard uh, of any agreement, uh, it means that we have, in fact, I can say, uh, regime change. Every party comes to uh, power in wi uh, White House, uh, and therefore totally dis disregard any agreement by previous uh, party or previous government. Uh, and with, it will have a world, of course, impact on the whole world order, as we noticed that. Uh, now this uh, withdrawal from uh, JCPOA, which was uh, respected and uh, endorsed by United Nations Security Council. And uh, uh, as the whole world, in fact, admired Iran the maximum concession, uh, this uh, was disregarded. And of yeah. course, it has a consequence. I'm sure you notice that the whole world condemned uh, Trump's administration, what they have done. Now, regarding the sanctions, of course, uh, while we have uh, had bitter experience, what we have been able to uh, resist the sanctions, I can say also, based on my experience, that there is a United Nations Convention Against uh, Corruption. Uh, US, Iran, Turkey, uh, 186 are members of it, and it was discussed and uh, negotiated in Vienna, which was, in fact, in charge. Uh, I can say that sanctions is also economic terrorism, and uh, in fact, US is violating this United Nations right. Convention also. Right. The nuclear issue is foundational in many ways with regards to everything else we're talking about. And I know you want to talk security and counterterrorism, and this is right up your alley. Syria, in no place is the Iranian role seen as more divisive. In no place does it stir up more passions than the support of Bashar al-Assad in Syria, whether it's the Russian support of Bashar al-Assad or the Iranian support of Bashar al-Assad. We have little deals that have taken place in places like Idlib now, de-escalation zone. But fundamentally, Iran is seen as supporting a butcher and a murderer who is responsible for the vast majority of 400,000-ish deaths in Syria. Is it a price worth paying for the Iranians that Assad and the Iranians and the Russians have killed so many innocent people in this war? Uh, first, uh, let me uh, draw your kind attention to a fact that the source of instability and insecurity in the region is the Zionist regime of Israel. I was participating in a think tank, uh, Liechtenstein Forum in Vienna, when this whole thing uh, started. During that meeting that I'm revealing here now, a uh, closed meeting, some of the opponents were there and also uh, one of the top uh, religious leaders, uh, Christians uh, from Syria, 
Johannes Ibrahim, uh, he was the uh, an eminent uh, person. During that meeting, the Israelis also, a couple of them were there, very influential. During the break, his, they have told him and he told me that they have said that Israel has given a message to Mr. Assad that should be close with us as an ally and give up uh, any relation with Iran or uh, Lebanon. And since he has not accepted that offer, then he should pay, pay the price from now on. Okay, but I am saying a, that. Okay, there's a couple of things here. So on the one hand, it's that, and I need to be clear here so I understand it fully. On the one hand is that the Israelis are behind the opposition to Assad, but the Iranian line has been, it's jihadi terrorists behind, uh, who are in opposition to Assad. So the Israelis are behind jihadis, essentially. Let, let me also remind you that during the imposed war by Saddam, Saddam wanted to reveal uh, so-called the history of al qadisi uh, uh, triumph uh, of Arabs vis-a-vis uh, vis -vis Persians. Uh, which was a very uh, aggressive mentality, and Syria didn't join uh, because he wanted to mobilize all Arabs against uh, Iranians and uh, supported us and helped us during the war. Therefore, we could not forget this historical support. That is one point. Second point, the source of a threat against our security is far outside our border, and we have to take care of that, but again, including the terrorist group and ISIS. Okay, but again, I ask you about whether Assad killing so many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of innocent people is a price worth paying for national would, security, and you would say you, Israel. May I, Israel uh, hasn't dropped barrel bombs we, we on these people. With due respect, uh, could you correct yourself that uh, many terrorists kill the people invasion uh, and interference of Americans uh, and others in the region has caused so many deaths and refugees. And apart from it, I just want to draw your attention to another memory that I think is, is revealed here. When I participated in Munich Security Conference, in fact, uh, in 2012, uh, at that time, uh, uh, one of the leaders of the uh, oppositions were present also there. And there was a request for meeting with my foreign minister, His Excellency at that time, Dr. Salehi. Uh, I was there in that meeting. He accepted. I was in that meeting, in an important meeting. In that important meeting, uh, Dr. Salehi, on behalf of Iran, said that we are ready to play the role that Syrian will talk to each other, Syrian, Syrian mm -hmm. solution. We want to prevent any bloodshed. And therefore, if this is the real intention of opponents, just don't go to arm struggle, put guns down, okay. and negotiate. And that gentleman, after an hour or so, was convinced that Iran had goodwill, political determination, prevent, uh, prevention of any escalation, mm -hmm. and to find a way and play the role. And very soon, that gentleman was removed, and we see the, uh, in fact, uh, unfortunate situation that we are facing. But of course, uh, this also is a lesson, what happens in Syria, for U.S. and others to let lessen uh, and uh, that do, they were making miscalculations. Okay, let, let me ask David. David, what does this mean for Iranian foreign policy moving forward that the support of Assad has been seen as something of a victory given that the Russians and the Iranians are in a way driving the narrative right now? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, I, I would say that both Russia and Iran is, it has been unconscionable in Syria. I have to say that on a moral point. On a geostrategic level, um, it's, it's a victory for Iran and Russia. I mean, you know, I don't think that we can really argue this. Um, I think it will, you know, empower certain elements that the U.S. is, is hostile to, or maybe not so hostile mm -hmm. in the case of Russia. And, you know, look, I mean, you know, as I say, we have a moral level, which I've already <laughs> told you about. We have a geopolitical level. I mean, Iran sees, you know, the fall of Assad as an existential threat, right, to its security. So it was never going to compromise on that. The Russian aspect is slightly different, which involves Putin's internal politics, something I've been looking at a lot in my book, and the need to project power. But, I mean, I think, again, this goes to making the region more unstable. It, it's, you know, it's, there has been a clear victory there with the um, keeping in of Assad. This is going to further inflame various powers like Saudi Arabia, things like that. And the, and the, you know, the lock, the, the, the clash between, you see between Sunni and Shia, I think is only going to deepen. 
Let me also add one important Very fine, uh, information yes. for you and for your distinguished viewers. When uh, Syria joined Chemical Weapon Convention, which in fact we also encouraged to do so because we have been the main uh, victim of uh, contemporary age of chemical weapons with hundreds of thousands victims uh, of by Saddam, uh, I was appointed uh, by my foreign minister as a special envoy and advisor to Syria to implement this convention fully. And uh, therefore, I went to Damascus and talked to the officials and tried to help them and even educate the people how to implement fully this convention because this is very serious for us also that everybody should destroy the chemical weapons. And it is important for you to know that U.S., according to the convention, is violated of convention because every country had 15 years to destroy all chemical weapons. Until now that I'm talking to you, the only country was violated this chemical weapon convention is U.S. Okay. And it's a, uh, the Syrian destroyed all the chemical weapon convention. But when the inspectors came from The Hague, part of the countries was not under control of the government. Therefore, whatever it happens later on is related to that matter that the material were not fully controlled and uh, accessible to the inspectors of OPCW. Therefore, you can get this message what I'm talking about. Okay. I've got to move on. But I thank you both for joining us. And thank David you. Thank you. Karkos and okay. Ali Asghar Sultania. Thank you. Thanks thank for you very much. Newsmakers. Welcome back to the special edition of the Newsmakers from the TRT World Forum here in Istanbul. Now, you can't talk about global security without talking about Syria. It's unresolved, war rages on, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed, and millions have become refugees. Now, one country that has changed the way it approaches the refugee question has been Italy. Randolph Nogo has more. <laughs> Far cadere il muro di Berlino una volta sarebbe stato impensabile. E il prossimo muro che facciamo cadere è quello di Bruxelles, restituendo ai popoli europei il diritto al lavoro, il diritto alla vita, il diritto alla salute, il diritto alla sicurezza. He's not prime minister, but Matteo Salvini is widely seen as the most influential politician in Italy today. More and more Italians appear to be endorsing Salvini's anti-immigration and Eurosceptic politics. The latest polls show his League party winning nearly a third of all votes if an election were held today, making it more popular than its coalition partner, the Five Star Movement, which topped all other parties in Italy's national election in March. Both parties have soared in popularity from the margins of Italy's body politic on a wave of anti-establishment anger. The Five Star Movement has promised to give all Italians a citizenship income or guaranteed minimum salary, while Salvini's League has been more divisive, playing on identity politics and perhaps taking a page out of U.S. President Donald Trump's political playbook. Prima gli italiani. Prima gli italiani. Salvini, now Italy's interior minister, is following up on his campaign promises to crack down on illegal immigration. His decision in June to close all ports to NGO ships carrying migrants drew concern from EU members. But at home, it seems to have only made him more popular. Italy's coalition government has ruffled feathers in Brussels by cozying up to leaders like Hungary's Viktor Orban and Russia's Vladimir Putin. And most recently, Rome shocked European markets, rejecting budget deficit reduction targets, which were approved by the EU, and replacing them with more relaxed goals for 2020 and 2021. Italy holds the largest public debt in the Eurozone as a percentage of GDP after Greece, with the populist coalition government gaining momentum and the influential Salvini intent on reshaping the EU. Is a fissure widening between Rome and Brussels? I quindi penso che siamo vicini a una svolta storica a livello continentale. And is a showdown inevitable? Randolph Nogle, The Newsmakers. Franco Frattini, thank you for joining us here in Istanbul on The Newsmakers. Thank you very much. Good to have you on the program. Interesting things going on in your country right now, especially with regards to the Interior Minister Matteo Salvini. And most recently, 
he has threatened to sue Jean-Claude Juncker from the EU. There's this little tussle going on between your country and the European Union or the European Commission. As somebody who's been on both sides, how do you feel about this? Who's right? Well, um, the situation is very complex in my country because uh, what is uh, happening now is the results of years and years of European Union, I would say, underestimating some serious national security issues affecting Italy, in particular migration. Uh, Italians, and particularly Italian voters, when it came to the elections in March, decided to be, I would say, a bit tougher vis-a-vis -vis European Union, feeling to have been left alone while facing migration crisis during the last years. And this is the result. People said it's time to uh, vote for those that have been uh, able in the past and will be able to resist to uh -huh. European tendencies and lack of solidarity or national egoism or closing the borders and leaving Italy to its destiny vis-a-vis -vis African migration flows. Uh -huh. This is the result. Unfortunately, there have been attempt to explain to European Union, Italy has to be taken into serious consideration. We have been advocating, for example, for more investment, for more growth and job initiative instead of simply austerity-based policies. Uh, I, you know, I get the Italian people feel insulted. They feel they want a sense of dignity and independence. They felt over the past few years, whether it's in Lampedusa and elsewhere, Italy is bearing the burden of the refugee crisis while everybody else is preaching and the sanctimonious morality while the Italians are doing a lot of the hard work, right? I, I get it. But does it justify a lot of what we've heard from people like Salvini, which every time we have a debate about Italy, when we have somebody from Lega versus others, the others always call the Lega fascists. They call them fascists, they call them racists, they call them xenophobes. And they have a lot of examples, comments about Roma, comments about Muslims, comments about, about uh, migrants. Has it been justified that there's this sharp edge to Italian policy and it doesn't like outsiders? Uh, well, um, in, in some cases, uh, we are talking about a very tough domestic political uh, fight between those that are still uh, now in the opposition and those that are the, the ruling coalition of Italy. So all those insulting expressions like fascist, racist, that are, have nothing to do with the Italian people. Uh, I want to stress, first of all, that Italian police and Coast Guard forces has been, have been rescuing thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the high seas in the past years. But and until, until they stopped doing it. But and now, they said, Aquarius, I'm sorry, you people can die. You don't have to come to our uh, country. This is, this is not correct, because uh, just uh, two weeks ago, a, an Italian military vessel rescued a group of migrants. But after that is the different treatment respect to the past. Now, after having rescued people, we try to give them back to the first destination country, which is Malta. And Malta refuses to get those migrants or to send back those people to Libya because those people had been rescued mm -hmm. within the territorial rescue water of Libya. So we want just to reaffirm a principle. Italy cannot be the only country responsible for getting on board all those that are rescued. Uh, two weeks ago, President Macron of France, who is uh, uh, very, I would say, in a very tough way, uh, uh, 
naming Italy as one of the countries that are doing uh, everything is wrong on dealing with migrants, he himself decided to close Marseille mm -hmm. port to migrants and say, oh, no, 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 you no, think he's a they cannot come to France, yeah. please. You think he's a hypocrite? Well, no. I think uh, President Macron is following national interest of mm. France. A national interest of France is not the one to give the impression that France is ready to right. welcome everybody. The same applies to Italy or to Spain. You mentioned that they can go back to Libya. It's no picnic going back to Libya. A lot of African migrants are being sold li in literal slave markets right now in Libya. The country's in civil war, even Tripoli. The capital of the UN-backed government is a mess. You've got militias yes. roaming. So, fine. According to the law, you can send people back to Libya. Well, you got on a boat in Libya. This is Libyan sea space. We have to send you back. In reality, in good conscience, is it moral or ethical to send people back to a country like Libya right now? Uh, well, uh, we have two elements. The uh, human dimension is, to me, the most important one. When I used to be European uh, vice president uh, back in 2004, 2008, I'd made a proposal already at the time to the director of United Nations Refugees Agency. At the time, it was Mr. Guterres, who is the current secretary general. And we had agreed to establish UN centers in the transit countries. So I can send back people under the protection and the monitoring of UN-led centers. That there were some problems. There were the so-called Arab Springs. And now the, pro the, progress, the project is being revitalized. Uh, Secretary Guterres said, I'm ready. Till that moment, we have to take care that mm -hmm. all those people are not sent back to the horrible detention situation. And this is why Italy is ready to fund Libya, to pay money to Tunisia and to other transit countries in order to guarantee decent human condition of custody in those countries. If that is not possible, our proposal is to share the burden among European member states. Malta is a small country. Spain is a bigger country. France, the Netherlands, Belgium, all those countries have to bear proportionally the burden right. of immigration. This is our proposal, not to send back every, everyone regardless the human custody condition. Mm -hmm. This is our proposal. When Gaddafi was in charge of Libya, you stood with him and struck a deal as the Italian government to manage migration better. Gaddafi might have been many things, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. From your guys' perspective, he was playing ball when it came to migration and stemming the flow of migration. Given everything that happened with the Arab Spring after his overthrow, after his killing, and what happened to Libya, was he a better guy to deal with, with this current mess? Well, this is exactly the reason why it is absolutely well known our government, when I was foreign minister and Berlusconi prime minister, was the most reluctant state to engage against Gaddafi. Our open question to Clinton, to Sarkozy, to Cameron was, please, guys, what next in Libya? Mm. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We have to rush to the war. We have to go there. They are killing innocent people. And we said, OK, but what next? And our mistake was, immediately after the falling of Gaddafi regime, we, within brackets, won the war, we lost the peace. Because at a certain moment, beginning of 2012, we left Libya to its destiny. Because uh, America disengaged, Europe was trapped into the economic crisis, we were diverted our attention from the future of Libya, and now there is a situation where there is a real risk of a partition of Libya in two or three parts. And so it's absolutely necessary now to have a compact group, a coalition 
where uh, Russia, United States, uh, Turkey, Egypt, and Arab countries get together to have a reconciliation government in Libya. Otherwise, there is a concrete risk of partition of Libya. Final question. For those who look at Italy as just one among many European countries, swinging right, swinging populist, and swinging away from European integration, it's reasserting confidently its Christian values, its nationalism, its populism, and Italy is one of them. Are they right? Uh, well, uh, it is the reaction to the opposite excesses of the past. We have been in a situation where others used to deny our identity, to try to affect our identity, to dictate from Brussels even what we should do in our daily life. And this was not acceptable, and the Italian voters reacted. So let's go ahead, let's explain that Italy is and will be one of the founding members of European Union. Never Italy will leave European Union, but of course we need respect. We need, I would say, put in common our sovereignty if necessary, but in some cases we need to preserve our national history, culture, identity, while integrating other identities, because uh, otherwise we run the risk to lose our historical identity. And this is not acceptable for the majority of Italians. Franco Frattini, thank you for joining us. And that's all for this special edition of the Newsmakers from the TRT World Forum in Istanbul. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.